Mm -hmm. right. uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming to the second part of this uh, of this lecture series on like understanding life and habitability on on Mars. And we'll take it uh, from where we left uh, the previous class. So we learned about like what's life, what's habitability, and uh, what does it mean for Mars in particular, like why do we think Mars is a planet that might have had uh, life in the past and uh, liquid water played an important role in understanding like redox processes, photosynthesis, chemosynthesis, all that. In today's class, what we will try to understand is, uh, we will, yeah. uh, so what we'll try to understand is go back and understand how the we started our curiosity from the historic time, from pre, like from thousands of years ago to what we know now. How did we start our, um, like, our quest for this red planet? We'll try to understand that. Uh, we'll we'll start from somewhere around like prehistoric times or like five thousand years, not prehistoric, like five thousand years ago, and we'll try and understand how we saw Mars at that time, like 5,000 years ago, how Romans, Babylonians, they they looked at Mars and what did they think? And then we'll come to like about 1500, like pre-1600 era, we'll try and understand what uh, the understanding was of Mars was at that point of time. And then we'll come to the modern uh, place, uh, the modern times where we'll try and understand what were the major um, rovers that were sent, what, what were the major, uh, uh, expeditions that were sent to Mars uh, and what did we understand from doing those experiments. Some of these will be will be carried over to the next uh, lecture too. So sometimes I will just let you know like a little bit about what was the overall uh, like purpose of say, say a Viking, um, uh, the Viking experiments, the Viking missions. And we'll move into the details of those things in, in the next in the next lecture. So all right, so the previous lecture, if you were not here or were not able to like attend, I have uploaded this. So, so Karen helped me record these videos and we so I have uploaded this uh, on my on my YouTube channel. In this you can see your um, this planetary geoscience. So the, the, the other lectures will be recorded here too. So the previous lecture is, is here already. All right. So in, in the past, in the last class, we, we kind of uh, had this, tried to understand life and habitability, what that meant, what were the definitions of habitability, habitable zones in the solar system, and the planetary bodies that had the, at the maximum uh, potential for life. Uh, for example, like Mars, the ocean worlds like Europa, Enceladus, Titan maybe, and things like that. And is Mars habitable? And we, 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 like, we try to understand this by understanding our favorite meteorite, Allen Hills 84001, which had the microbes like, or the nanobes. I, I think I have to because I'm like recording that on Zoom as well. We can close the door. My, yeah, maybe I'm too loud. <laughs> All right, so so we we try to understand like why we we thought that ALH eight four double zero one had signs of uh, Martian life. The ALH 84001, the Allen Hills meteorite, it had uh, microbe-like structures. I, I, they were like nanobe-like structure, um, nanometer in time, in, in, in length scales. And it had carbonate minerals. It had um, uh, magnetite. So we, we kind of like thought that, okay, all these might be a signature of life on a different planet. Just a little bit, about what we are going to do today is like, we'll try and understand some of the early views of Mars, um, like from say 5,000 years ago to about like pre 1600s. 
and telescopic observations began in that era, like up just after 1600s. We had Galileo build his own telescope, and there were other major players like Francisco uh, Fontana, and there were a few who made their own telescopes and started looking at uh, Mars, Moon, Venus, and other planetary bodies. Uh, Galileo uh, discovered the Galilean moons on Jupiter, so a really important time in, in ast astronomy and astrology at that time. We'll also look into the first flyby missions, the Mariner, the, the, the first important or the first successful one was Mariner 4. Uh, the, uh, the, the, this was the start of the space race uh, between the two major players, America, USSR, while um, uh, getting to the moon was a major thing that we wanted to do. Mars was next major stop. USSR started to make like big attempts at uh, going to uh, the moon, the Mars. The Mars expeditions were not that important, uh, were not that successful for Russia, but the Russians were really successful for Venus landing uh, missions. The Venera uh, missions were really successful. But the, we started first by the flybys, the Mariner, the Voyager, and, and, and those kind of uh, uh, major uh, missions. Then we'll move on to just slightly talking about the Viking biology experiments and how they were not that successful. And then there was this whole slew of orbiters that gave us understanding about the topography of Mars. So we now have brilliant data from Mars that tell us uh, a lot about the topography. We have better data for topography on, on Mars than sometimes on Earth. And we'll, we'll look into that why, we, why I'm saying that. And we'll try and get oriented on the map of Mars um, because we tend to understand the Earth by just looking at our planet. We try to orient ourselves by looking at the continents and the oceans. It's important to orient ourselves on Mars as well. And it's it will be a little bit challenging for Mars to start with because it's all land, but there are some major ge like geological and geomorphological like features on the surface of, of Mars, like the volcanoes, the, the Grand Canyons of Mars. The Grand Canyons of Mars. Um, and they will they will be really good like markers for us to like orient on, on the on the surface of uh, on the surface of Mars, then uh, this will form like a major a part of our discussion today is so geomorphological evidence for for liquid water on the surface of Mars, and we'll not only see what are the geomorphological evidence today. In the next lecture, we'll look in some of the geochemical evidence, like what are the geochemistry related, what are the different minerals that say for certainty, with certainty that okay, liquid water was like stable on the surface of Mars. So we'll start off by looking into the geomorphological evidence like, like gullies, um, canyon systems, or um, there are um, valley networks and outflow channels and things like that. Then we'll look into some of the, the evidences of uh, ice uh, and liquid uh, and water ice. So there is carbon dioxide ice too on the polar caps. But by this ice, I mean, there are evidences of liquid like uh, water ice h2o ice in the martian surface and what do we know about that and then then i'll just end with this paradox of climate on early mars it, this is not too relevant for our for our topic at, in this lecture series but this is a major point of debate for mars the martian community so i went to the uh, so there is a lunar and planetary science conference that happens every year in Woodlands, I was fortunate to like go there uh, this year after like COVID. And it still was and still is trying to understand what was the climate of early Mars? Because we know, so there are geomorphological evidences that there was liquid on Mars. There are geochemical evidence, but we cannot seem to reconcile how liquid water was stable on the surface of Mars. I'll briefly touch upon that idea uh, in, in in today's uh, like few of the last slides. All right, just a brief recap of what we did last time. So we saw that for life, we need the basic elements 
uh, to start with, we need carbon, hydrogen, the sponge elements, and they make up, they are the building blocks of life. They make up the, the different biomolecules, the, the proteins, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the fats, all these, so we need the elements. We need, so we need a medium in which you can actually form these kinds of uh, biomolecules. So we, water is one of those uh, very important mediums that, that are relatively available in our solar system. And we need liquid water to promote these different elements to come together and form uh, bonds between themselves and form the biomolecules. Um, energy is another major part because energy is from where we get the, the, the energy for metabolism, for the, for the origin of life, for the sustenance of life. So energy is important. And we talked about a little bit about, uh, talked about uh, the dietary restrictions, photosynthesis and chemosynthesis. These are the two really uh, the most important forms of energy that life can use for metabolism. So photosynthesis, chemosynthesis. Photo means light, so light energy, chemosynthesis means the energy that we get from the redox, uh, the redox reactions and the exchange of electrons, things like that. Um, uh, all right, so we also saw that organic carbon and the different elements are really common on the, uh, uh, in our solar system. And that is also common on Mars as well. So we have uh, organic uh, compounds falling in, uh, forming in molecular clouds in carbonaceous meteorites. Remember the carbonaceous meteorites as a, are, a, are a form of uh, chondrites. So they form chondrules and carbonaceous meteorites are those which have carbon containing compounds. Uh, we saw that there was this, um, the, 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 the Miller experiment, the Miller-Urey experiments in which we took these different kinds of uh, reduced gases, we passed electricity through them and we were able to form amino acids, which were very similar to the amino acids that we see in the carbonaceous meteorites. And we also uh, have uh, data from comets like the, the, the image in here. We, this is the 67P uh, meteorite, uh, sorry, uh, the comet from which we were able to actually sample the surface of that comet. And we found that it's full of carbon containing compounds. So to reiterate carbon, or organic carbons are really, organic compounds are really common on the surface of Mars or on the surface of uh, different kinds of planetary bodies. But getting specific types of carbon molecules in sufficient quantities is the challenge. So we'll look into that uh, a little later too. So just to reiterate, like getting the certain types of organic compounds in large numbers on demand at certain locations, at certain types of environments can only uh, lead us to life uh, and habitability. Uh, I talked about this uh, before, will not spend more time on this. And we saw uh, the different kinds of habitable zones in our solar system. And with this can be, will, uh, be taken beyond our solar system in which we are trying to understand what are the different regions in our solar system where liquid water can be stable? So we can have very hot zones, really, if you go really close to the sun, uh, when, when the distance is smaller, you can have uh, planets like Mercury, maybe Venus in these really hot zones. Earth is uh, forms a part of this, uh, it falls in this habitable zone. And then Mars and the other uh, gas giants are in this cold, colder zone. So we have a Goldilocks zone in our solar system, which, which is uh, basically determined by our sun's luminosity. But there are also other Goldilocks zones that I mentioned, which uh, that we see across these, uh, uh, around these gas giants. So we have Jupiter and due to its uh, massive size, it tidally locks these different moons of its um, of, of these gas giants. And that tidal energy, that gravitational pull kind of heats up these different moons. And you have a Goldilocks zone in, in, our, in, in, the, in Jupiter as well. So please keep in mind habitable zones across, uh, across our solar system. Um, so briefly, so this is the, the famous ALH at 8400 Allen Hills meteorite. 
really grateful for this meteorite because this kind of like re um, like revamped our uh, interest in Mars and in life on Mars because there was there was a period and I'll show uh, some some of the images from Mariner and Voyager not Voyager just the Mariner aircrafts which gave a very glim picture of so first we were really excited about Mars we sent the Viking rovers Viking gave very bad like very negative results of uh, life so it said that based on the biology experiments uh, there was no like um, signs of life. So the funding for Mars uh, kind of like went away and Ma NASA was not spending enough like energy, but then we got this meteorite and there was like uh, more and more people started thinking about life on, on planet and there was a revamped um, enthusiasm for understanding life and potential for habitability on, on, on Mars. So this is where we left in the last class. Like there are so many uh, uh, rovers and orbiters that we that we have seen on the surface of Mars, and we need to understand where it all began. So we'll we'll start with the Mariner, and then we will try and understand what were the different uh, rovers that were there, that uh, what were the different orbiters that went there. So Mars Odyssey, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, all these really um, like uh, really good quality imaging and spectroscopy uh, instruments were sent on these orbiters and we got a lot of data back. And then we had landers uh, like the Phoenix lander, the, the, the Mars exploration rovers, stuff like that. So right now we have like, like some of these retired rovers like the Opportunity, Spirit uh, and different locations. Two of these rovers like uh, are currently working Curiosity at Gale Crater and Perseverance rover at the Jezero crater. And we are expecting more uh, like rovers, more rovers uh, that from the different uh, space agencies that will be sent to Mars in the coming decades. All right, so let's, uh, let's understand like the early views uh, like of Mars, what we thought about Mars to begin with. So, It has like Mars had fascinated us like through ages. So we like we have seen we, we like the early human like maybe five thousand BC like times people saw a red dot in the sky and they were like really scared of it and they named it the god of war and in different cultures named it like all of them kind of had a negative bias towards Mars. That's what I think. So all these different, um, so red color was possibly associated with, with danger and not so, so it was like a bad omen for like different cultures. So uh, the Greeks and the, the, the Greeks and the Romans named it uh, Mars or Ares, the God of war, so the Roman God of war. Um, so on the right hand side, we see the Egyptians also named uh, the red one or a hard decker. I do not know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but again, like uh, uh, the red planet kind of like caught their attention. The middle one is the Indian. Uh, in Indian mythology, we have a uh, Mangal, that's how we call it. And the, the rover that, the orbiter that was sent on Mars was called Mangal Yan. And Yan means uh, a chariot or like a vehicle. So it's something like that. So we, we also sent like uh, the ISRO, the Indian Space Agency also sent the Chandrayaan. So this was Mangal and it was also called Lohitang, means lo Loha in, 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 in Hindi means iron. So some, somewhere it was associated with iron, the red color, with all these kind of like different uh, bad ominous, om ominous thing. Tuesday, like the day Tuesday is actually dedicated to Mangal. Mangal actually means uh, a good omen, but in astrology, the, like the previous form of astronomy, it was a very bad omen. So people who were born on Tuesdays were not considered, so they were not, they had, even, even today in India, we have problems uh, in which uh, people who are born on, on Tuesdays are, have problems getting married. So the people who are relying on astrology and things like that. So bad omen all along, people were scared of Mars. 
I'm like fast forwarding it into the uh, 17th century, like Francisco Fontana was one of the very like, uh, like a uh, few people who were, who was not an astronomer by profession, but he was able to make his own telescope. He pointed it out to Mars and he started observing the things that he could, right? And you see, like, this is the diagram that he, that he draw, not a very accurate. So th this is, this is how the modern day telescopes would see it. And this is the, the drawing that he, that he made um, just by observing Mars through his telescope, not a very accurate uh, representation. We, we do not see this, this ring structure. I don't know what he meant by drawing this, this thing in here. But he was very enthusiastic, so let's let he deserves a position in the slide. So that's that's what I think. Like he deserves to be here because he was very enthusiastic. Christian Huygens is one of the very important uh, astronomers, uh, and he was able to direct his telescope to Mars, and he was kind of like accurately able to see certain really important features. On Mars. So all these dark toned uh, things that you see in here, these were the Sirtis major lava flows as we know now. So he named it, uh, I'm, I think he named it. He named this dark region, the Sirtis major region. Also the, the nomenclature of these things were done by many different kinds of people and they all were really ominous. Like, they all were like names from hell and like bad. So like, yeah, so all these, the, the general uh, idea was like, it's not a pretty planet. Um, it's, it was like equivalent to hell. So, but, but these lava flows were like accurately mapped by Christian Huygens. And one of my, my, my one of my uh, colleagues uh, at the geosciences department has this like, uh, this thing tattooed on his arms, it's really cool. Really important for Mars at that time. Like just imagine in like it's 16, like in the 17th century, we are getting quite like good information about Mars. And you see this little, like this, this circular thing. This was the Martian polar cap. So which was also picked up by Christian Huygens through his telescope, which we can see even now. So if you have a decent sized telescope, you can see and you'll be able to find this northern polar cap, white looking northern polar cap, which is CO2 ice and uh, water ice combined. Important uh, discoveries made at that time. Now, 150 years later, uh, Giovanni Schiaparelli, he had a little bit advanced uh, telescopes and he was able to uh, like see a little bit more on the surface of Mars and he, he, so this is, this is what I was saying, that the names were derived from mythology and like various terms for hell were used to map out different regions of, of, of Mars. And so you see this Hellas basin, this is, this we'll see is actually a true, a true uh, geomorphological feature. So this is one of the deepest basins. The Hellas basin is one of the deepest basins on the surface of, uh, of Mars. An interesting thing that he said, uh, Schiaparelli at that time, he said that Mars had canales, which was loosely transformed to canals. But what he meant was he saw channels on Mars. I think Schiaparelli was Italian or French. I am not really sure, but so the loose translation of canali became canals in English. And that was kind of like a misnomer. So he wanted to say there were channels on Mars. And you see these, uh, these things. This is what he meant by the channels. He saw more than what he actually saw in my opinion, because these things did not exist on the surface of Mars. So he had his own telescopes. He drew these really spectacular images. And he said that there are canals or channels on the surface of Mars. And this idea was picked up by Percival Lowell. Uh, and he set up 
his uh, observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. And we have the Lowell Observatory even now in Flagstaff, Arizona. And this was the best place for Mars uh, observation at, at, at this point in time. And he said he had like brilliant stories backing up this idea of canals and channels on Mars. And he wrote like three really important books at that time, Mars, Mars and its canals, and Mars as the ab adobe, uh, abode of life. This gate, what he was trying to say in here is that there were Martians on Mars, like there were actual Martians. And there was this white polar caps that was the only source of liquid water on the surface. And Mars was drying up. And the Martians that were there at that time built those canals to get liquid water from the poles to those equatorial regions. So that was his thing. And he was an expert of the, on these kinds of matters at that time. So the press ate it up. And they were like, Martin, and these were the types of newspaper articles that were coming up at that point. And they were, they were like, yes, this is actually happening. There are Martians. And at that time, a whole slew of Martian literature came up. So H.G. Wells and a whole slew of like fiction on green bodied Martians and not so uh, like, uh, uh, what do you say, not so, a uh, hospitable world and not so hospitable people. And this whole story of like Martians and the drying of Mars was there at that time, 1894, 1900s and things like that. But we, like, we know that this is false, but claims like these were made at very early. Like uh, there is life on planet Mars and this kind of like gave a big uh, like push to science fiction literature at that point. It's still going on, and a big push to uh, astronomers to look into uh, to look into Mars. So we did actually try and send uh, Martian uh, rovers, but first we started to have like better telescopic observations on Mars, and we were trying to understand basic uh, uh, basic basic things about Mars, like. What's the temperature on the surface of Mars? Uh, what's, uh, if we have liquid water, what was, um, how much liquid water is present on the surface and things like that. So before going into uh, the details of how we detected the temperature on Mars, we're just trying to understand this concept called the black body radiation, in which we, when, we, when we think about the black body radiation, let's think about, um, the electromagnetic, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, on uh, electromagnetic spectrum that we have. So this is the visible. So somewhere from like 0.4 to 0.7 microns, uh, micrometers is is our visible. So we have uh, the higher energetic uh, wavelengths in here and lower energy. So energy of the the of this uh, of these wavelengths is measured as hc by lambda um, h is the planck's constant c is the speed of light lambda is uh, the wavelength this can also be equated as h and the and the frequency so not this part so c by lambda is actually the frequency so when you increase the wavelength you decrease the energy so these the, the, if the wavelengths are increasing in here so these are less in energy, energy is less in this side, they have more energy on this side. So what, we, what, what, what I'm trying to uh, think about here is the infrared. So this is a very important part of the spectrum. And we think that, all right, when we have an infrared spectrum, uh, by general uh, observations that we uh, that we have uh, on our, like by our day-to-day -day lives, we see that when we heat up a body, it radiates. So we have red hot bodies. So when you increase the temperature of that, the wavelength increases. So when you have, when the temperature increases of a, of a heated body, the wavelength 
decreases. So this is what is shown in here in which we are plotting the spectral radiance or the energy on the y-axis and the wavelength on the x-axis. So in which in this we show that, okay, whenever you have higher temperatures, your lambda will be less. So, so this is like 6,000 uh, uh, Kelvin uh, is the temperature of, of the surface of the sun. So the sun is emitting its radiation at about this wavelength, which peaks at about like 0.6 micron. Uh, and that's why we, our, our evolution, like human beings have evolved to see at this particular wavelength because the sun is radiating at 6,000 Kelvin and 6,000 Kelvin is maxing out its emission at that particular wavelength, 0.6. And that is why our eyes are tuned to visualizing things best at that visible wavelength. Now, when you decrease uh, the temperatures, you see the 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 wavelength at which it is maxing out is kind of increasing. So we are when you're increasing the temperature, the wavelength is decreasing. When you are decreasing the temperature, the wavelength is increasing. So this emission that every particular body has, we call it like the black body radiation. This is a, 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 a phenomenon which is a, um, a very basic concept in physics, but this is kind of like a, a perfect scenario. I will not get into the details of this, but uh, when I like post the videos on, on the channel, I'll have a section on black body radiation specifically to like elaborate more, more on this. But right now we have to understand like every body at a particular temperature will emit radiation at a particular wavelength. Now, somehow if we can, so in here, So you have the wavelength in, uh, here and the energy on the y-axis. Now, if you have an instrument, so like in COVID, we were very used to this handheld temperature meters that people were using to measure the temperature of, 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 of your body. What that was actually doing is the wavelengths were actually fixed at about 10 microns, and I will not get into the details of why 10 microns is being used and why not. So because this can be happening at any wavelengths, why 10 micron, I'm not getting into that. But uh, at 10 microns, the emitted light, the emitted energy is more than the reflected energy of the sun. It's, it's that, because if you have say a mirror and you're trying to measure the temperature of that mirror, so you, have that handheld uh, temperature meter. And if I just reflect the sunlight off of that, if I am measuring at a wavelength where the wavelength of reflected light, so this is, say this is reflected light, and this is emitted light. So if say I'm measuring at, 0 0.6 microns. If I'm if my handheld temperature meter is is operating at 0 0.6 micron, then the emitted light will be recorded in that handheld gun. The emitted light is could be from the sun. So the sun, so the handheld uh, temperature meter will actually record the temperature of the reflected light, not the temp not the temperature of the mirror itself. The mirror might be cooler, by, but the way it is reflecting the sunlight, the, the handheld thermometer might take the temperature of the sun, the reflected one. But if we move on to this range of like 10 micrometer, the reflected light goes down and the emitted light, the energy of the emitted light becomes more than the energy of the reflected light. So if, I, if I'm measuring at 10 microns, I will not be measuring the reflected light, but the, in, but the temperature of the body itself. So if I'm measuring at 10 microns in here, I fix the wavelength and I fix, and, I, and my measurement is taking the energy that is being produced, the, the, my, my thermometer is able to, my, my thermometer is able to 
measure the energy that is coming out at this particular wavelength, I will be able to tell the temperature. Because if I'm fixing this at 10 micron, depending on the, the energy, I can tell what temperature it is. So this is what we actually did for Mars. What we did is we took a telescope and we pointed it out to Mars and we were trying to find out at a particular wavelength, the energy or the photons that we were getting from Mars. So this is what was done in this like a uh, seminal paper by Sinton and Strong. What they did is they had their own telescope. They had a very powerful telescope. Now, if, if, if you have a telescope, which is like, so now uh, if you have, uh, like if you are measuring, if you are measuring say the surface of this, Uh, so this is this is a body that you're trying to measure the temperature, and you are trying to measure. So and this is your thermometer. You are getting so you're pointing it out like this to the to the thermometer, and you're getting all that energy that is coming from from that body. Now, the farther you move back, the more area you're getting from that body. What I mean to say is, if if your body is say here. You end up getting more area, so you, and this the, the amount of area becomes like a d squared kind of like a unit. And we're moving farther away. The energy that reaches you decreases. The number of photons that you're getting from that body decreases. So that also becomes a function of d squared. So these two cancel out. So if you're pointing your uh, handheld gun temperature gun to any of the surfaces, it does not matter how far or how close you are to that body because these two units cancel out. The amount of energy is really close when you are really close to the surface, but the area is small. And when you're back, the area becomes wider, but the energy becomes less. So it does not matter where you are, you are getting the appropriate temperature of that body. But for Mars, this becomes a little bit problematic because you might, so, if, so you might just point your handle thing to Mars and get the temperature of Mars, but that is not possible. Because the field of vision that becomes so big that Mars kind of sits in here and you're getting all those different kinds of things. So this is not a good like way to measure the temperature of Mars. What we need, what we need to do is build a telescope that can only take a part of Mars and then use the same technique to measure the temperature. Now, people were really smart and they built uh, like uh, really good telescopes. So this uh, red dot in here was the field of view of the telescope that Sinton and Strong used to measure the temperature of Mars. So they took that and they measured different swaths of the planet. So they did like this swat, they did an equator, and they did this, and they were trying to measure the temperature at these various different points in time. And they were getting these different results. So these, the temperatures were higher during the noon, the temperature were like getting below uh, at other times of the day, and things like that. They also did uh, like uh, longitudinal swaths like this and got the temperature. So this was a really basic idea that they had. And this is what they plotted. So they had the temperature and this is in degrees Celsius. So this was zero degree Celsius, like the freezing point of water is zero degree uh, Celsius. And then you have 50 degrees Celsius in here and like minus 100 frigid temperatures in here. And you can see that at certain points of time, you are at freezing temperatures, but at certain points of the day, you are actually getting warmer temperatures. So as so this could be anywhere like th at 30 degrees Celsius or something like that. So there is a range of temperature 
that Mars goes. It's not constant. The things like this, this measurement was at the equator and the, uh, it showed that at certain points of the day, Mars actually experienced temperatures that were more than zero degrees Celsius. And this was actually measured in like 1959. Really good observations just by understanding uh, um, black body radiation. Now, and this was like, we were trying to measure the black body radiation emission at 10 microns. All right, now we also wanted to detect like water in the atmosphere of Mars. Now, to do this, what we have to do is similar. It's, there is a, it's a similar idea. Point your telescope towards Mars and measure the different kinds of emissions that are coming out. Now, what we see here is a, a black body radiation, which is like the perfect. So this is like the ideal black body radiation at 6,000 Kelvin, and this is sun's surface. So ideally, if you look at the sun, this, the, the blue curve is what you should observe. But when you are measuring the spectra, like when you're measuring the energy coming out from the sun, from the earth, you get this weird, non-perfect looking spectra with these dips. There are these dips. These dips are basically the indication that there are absorptions in that spectrum. So you have a black body spectrum and the energy is not that high. The energy is less. So the energy was supposed to be, say something in here, but the energy is now in this range. So there was a decrease in energy. Now this, where did this energy go? This energy was absorbed by some of the gases that are there in our atmosphere. So when we are trying to look at other planets, we will not be getting like ideal black body radiations because there are gases in, the, in our atmosphere, CO2 and H2, or these are, and O2, like these are the major gases that absorb a huge part of the energy that are coming. And this is like the basic understanding of like the greenhouse gases. So atmosphere will emit some of, will, 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 there, there are certain wavelengths that will easily pass through the atmosphere and there are certain wavelengths that will not. That is basically due to the different types of gases that are present in our atmosphere or in the atmosphere of the other planet. Now, if we are trying to see the sun, this is, this is what we are getting. Now, this is just the, the, our atmospheric transmission windows too. Now, if we want to understand what is there in the atmosphere of Mars, is there CO2 in the atmosphere of Mars? Is there water in the atmosphere of Mars? We wanted to know. We did not have uh, rovers and landers. We just had a telescope. But the major problem was our Earth has a big atmosphere. So either you have to take your telescope outside of our Earth's atmosphere. That's what the James Webb telescopes and all these are doing. They're taking it outside the atmosphere so, th so that you don't have these like, different interferences from the different gases or you understand which is the wavelength in which you need to measure things. It, it really becomes important. You can be measuring things at different wavelengths, but we have to choose uh, the wavelengths very carefully. Now, this is uh, what we call the atmos uh, atmospheric transmission windows. So windows are the windows in wavelength. So these are atmospheric wavelength windows through which we'll be able to either correctly look at the atmosphere or look at the different things that we want to see through our telescopes or not. On the y-axis, we have transmission. So this is the light amount of energy that is being transmitted. So this one is 100% transmission. So for example, at, at say at 10 or like say 12, between this window, we have almost 100% transmission. So there is no, except these, these little wiggles in here. Except these little wiggles, we have almost 100% transmission of energy or the wavelength, I'm sorry, no, energies in, in that wavelength, right, in our atmosphere. But there is almost zero energy transmitted at these wavelengths because of CO2. 
And this is the reason we have like greenhouse gas. Like this is the reason that when we say CO2 is trapping the energy, this is the thing. Once the energy is trapped, the energy is not being able to transmit it through that window. That window is opaque. Energy cannot be transmitted through that window. So this, this is an opaque window. The energy cannot be transmitted. But if we want to measure things, we would be trying to measure things higher in, in this range or like this way, where we have good atmospheric windows through which we can do these measurements. And we'll see that the, some of the, some, I'll show one paper of Spinrad in which he actually was measuring this eight, eight micron uh, uh, range. Sorry, uh, 0.8 micron range, and I'll show you what that means. All right, uh, so there is another really simple effect called the Doppler effect. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the, the details of the Doppler effect, it's a basic idea, but I will try to get this Doppler effect, uh, a, a small description in the, in the YouTube channel when I, when I post these things. The idea is of the Doppler effect is like, when, when, we, when you're trying to measure the frequency of a wave, the frequency seems to vary if and if the object that is producing those frequencies approaching you or moving away from you. So the, the relative velocity between the observer, you, and the emitter, the, the source of that wavelength, if, if there is a relative velocity between these two, the actual frequency will vary. Either you will get a red shifted in which the, the frequency becomes less, or you have a blue shifted, the frequency becomes more. So when, when your source is moving towards you, you will have a blue shifted, the frequency becomes more. You see, when you compare this, it's more, it's more, the frequency is more. And in here, it is red shifted. So we have, we have heard about these things a lot. I'm not going into the details of this. Why this is important for Mars and observing or detecting liquid water in its atmosphere? Because imagine you are on Earth and you're trying to measure H2O in the atmosphere of Mars. So you will be trying to measure these different absorption features of water. Now you, you have seen that water has its absorption features here. There are some in this range also, like uh, between like zero, like um, there's a 0.8 micron range. Uh, I don't know what's happening. There's a 0.8 micron range in which have uh, too many H2O bands. So we would want to see, look at these absorption features, the absorption bands. Now, these absorption bands are at a certain frequency, at a certain wavelength, right? So if if you want to see, a, like, uh, if you're, so let's assume that at, say, I don't know, let's assume this is nine micron, you will, if Mars has ozone in its atmosphere, you will get an absorption band at that frequency, say at, at nine microns, you will get an absorption feature because the energy is being absorbed by the ozone molecule at that. But since Mars is moving and there is a relative motion between us and Mars, the actual frequency that you'll get or the actual wavelength at which you're getting the absorption will vary just by a little bit, but it will vary. So there is a Doppler shift. Now, uh, so this is Earth. These red, assume these reds are the different positions uh, of Mars. So th if, the, if the Mars is directly in line, so if Sun, Earth, and Mars are direct line, so you call it opposition. And there is a point in which Mars is at the opposite side of the sun, and this is called conjunction. And the really interesting thing is there there is a time in so when you when you're uh, when you have like rovers on the surface of Mars at conjunction, the rovers are not able to communicate with Earth. So there is a period of time when the rovers are not communicating with you. This is a separate uh, topic. I'm digressing, but this is interesting because. Uh, I did not know that there is a period of time that you don't know what's going what's going on. So the Martian rovers have they have to be like smart enough to sustain on their own during conjunction and then try and communicate with Earth after you're out of that conjunction. So, but important thing happens during uh, during 
these opposition and quadrature. Now, at this point, so Mars is moving away in this case, and Earth is moving too. So there is this, because of this relative velocity between, so the, between Mars and Earth, you will get a Doppler shift. So the Doppler shift when calculated, and I'm not going to calculate in here, is just something, something of this magnitude. Uh, 10 to the power minus four meters is the amount of like Doppler shift in the wavelength that you'll be seeing. So if you are, if you have uh, an ozone band at nine micron, you will get the ozone band for Mars at nine plus 10 to the power minus four meters, 10 microns plus whatever microns this is. So that will be the small amount of shift. And based on that small amount of shift, the scientists were able to identify whether there was uh, liquid water on the surface or not. So in this case, so water has bands all around. So you see oh, there are different kinds of water bands. So water will be absorbing energies in different wavelengths. So let's just see one wavelength. So this is from the paper of Spinrad. Uh, I'm like quoting it in here. Um, so let's, so this, this big band, this big absorption band is due to Earth. And this is the sign for Earth. So the cross thing is basically uh, the equator and the, and the prime meridian. So log latitude and longitude. Sun is uh, something like this. Mars is this. And this small shift in that H2O band, that small shift is basically the detection of liquid water in the atmosphere of Mars. Seems kind of like a big leap. Like, do you really, uh, like you really uh, have that much faith that that small thing is actually liquid water? Maybe not, but uh, I'm not showing the results in here, but all the different H2O bands that they had were like the Spinrad and the co-authors, they saw all the different H2O bands and every time they, they saw the, uh, this, uh, this shift, this 10 to the power minus four meter, uh, sorry, 10 to the power five minus four micron shift uh, in the actual H2O band, which was calculated for Mars at quadrature. And this was done for various different wavelengths. And I will have this paper on the website and you can take a look. It's a really great paper. It really comes down to the very basics of physics. Doppler effect and then trying to understand the atmospheric. So I, I, my mind just blows away like how simple the idea is, but how effective. So uh, there was detection of liquid water, like water vapor on Mars. And, but it was not a lot of uh, water and water was not on the surface. It was just in the atmosphere. So we were trying to understand the atmospheric uh, water vapor composition. But what about the polar caps? So we, our technologies were not good enough to detect liquid water on the surface. Spinrad's paper was able to detect water vapor in the atmosphere, but we were able to see. So this is a really old image. And in here too, you are able to see this cute polar ice cap. So we were like, but what about the ice caps? Are they water ice or are they H2O ice, that was the next um, big question that we will try to answer in here. We have to try and understand the heating and the composition. So we'll try and do some, not we'll not do it in here, but there is a paper that I'll just quote, uh, I forget the authors. What they did, they did some thermodynamic, uh, they did some uh, diffusion modeling in which they tried to understand if you heat, what is the surface temperature of Mars based on the amount of distance that you're away from the sun. Remember like the Goldilocks zone. So you, based on a certain distance that you are, you can actually, based on some assumptions, you can actually find out what's the temperature, what's the range of temperatures that Mars might be. At a certain distance, there is a fixed amount of sunlight that you're receiving. Based on the angle of incidence of light, based on your obliquity, you might be getting a different, uh, like surface area, 
So we'll try and understand what the temperature of Mars was just by basic uh, calculations, by just being at a certain distance uh, from the surface of Mars. And the results uh, that, uh, that, that I'm like trying to show in here by, uh, yeah, uh, Leighton and Murray, uh, what they tried to understand, they were trying to understand. So you have these polar caps, you can see these white poles. And when you see those polar caps during the summer, they were less during the summer. And then you measure the amount of liquid vape, like uh, water vapor in, in the atmosphere, that was more. And the reverse was happening during the winter. So you had, you had more uh, amount of uh, like aerial extent of uh, the ice caps during the winter and less H2O in the, in, the, in the atmosphere of Mars. So like, okay, let's do some basic mathematical modeling to understand what's, uh, what is the composition of, of those polar, polar caps. Now, this is just, some thermodynamic modeling based on uh, the, the thermal properties of, of, of the surface. So these Ks are the diffusivity co um, coefficients of the different, uh, like the surfaces of the different kinds of materials. And we were trying to understand what was the temperatures. And you can see in here, this is, I don't like degree Kelvin because that, that is a wrong thing to say, but they seem to have used it. So this is in Kelvin. So 273 Kelvin is basically zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit, the freezing point. So it should be somewhere in this region. And this was the equator, uh, this was zero degrees. So again, based on the modeling, it, they were able to show that at a certain time of the day in hours, so the, the x-axis is time in hours, during the noon, you might have some time in which you have more than zero degree Celsius temperatures. And these different error bars were from the previous paper. So you remember um, these, these data with the error bars were used in this later papers with these error bars. So it matched pretty well. So we can, we, we see here that at zero degree, like this at equator, we were able to form liquid water, but based on the different uh, latitudes, so minus 90 degrees, like at the poles, you're, you're getting really like, uh, uh, like lower temperatures. And at the equators, you're getting slightly higher temperatures. And based on these different temperature variations, this was, this was a modeling study that was done at that time. Based on these modeling results, they were able to understand what was the ice cap made up of. So this data in here, in here that you see is, so this is the radius of the of the ice cap that we are seeing. And this, this days from the summer solstice. So when zero is basically at summer solstice, uh, solstice. So when you are, when you are really close to summer, the area of the, I'm sorry, something, I'm doing something bad. When you're really close to the summer, the aerial, like the radius of the caps are really less. And when you're, uh, when you are far away, the the aerial uh, the area is really uh, more. So this was the observation, and you see, and this was how a CO two ice would correspond, and this is how a water ice would correspond. Based on this, what is the general idea that we can take? That this this the actual curve, which is this one matches closely, matches better with CO2 than H2O. So most of the polar ice that was there was likely CO2 ice, right? Or most of the ice that was fluctuating with these different summer and winter um, seasons, that was basically CO2 ice. Later we will learn that the ice caps are made up of both CO2 ice and H2O ice, Leighton and Murray in this paper said, 
that most of the ice that is your that is that forms the the northern polar cap uh, ice on Mars is basically CO2 because the actual observations matches better with the CO2 uh, with the CO2 model, all right. But we'll see later that it's both CO2 ice and water ice that makes the composition of the polar caps. But at that time, people were a little uh, not so happy because like it's not H2O ice, it's CO2 ice. Like when you have more H2O, more prospect for life, CO2, not so much. So let's look into some of the first flyby missions uh, that went to Mars uh, after taking a five minute break. <laughs> 